We have at the Smithsonian planes like this. Spirit of St. Louis took out, took off just a few miles from here in uh, in Queens. Babe Ruth baseballs, just like any good sports bar in New York City. And of course, Dorothy's red slippers. That are really iconic. Now they didn't start out that way. They weren't supposed to be red. They were actually supposed to be gray, silver, particularly. So it was silver on the yellow brick road. And if you go to the gold exhibit back there, you'll learn about that. But a new invention had come along that changed the color of the slippers. Anybody know what that invention was? Technicolor. And when you looked at Technicolor and you looked at silver, it kind of got washed out gray. So at the last minute, they substituted in, they put 2,000 sequins on a, a pair of painted slippers and they become ruby red. And that's how Dorothy got her shoes, got back to Kansas and saved the world. This was something that was shown right here in New York City at the World's Fair, 1939. This is one of the early TVs, RCA TV. Notice, now this is no widescreen TV, no curve, no 55 inch or 80 inch thing to watch the Super Bowl. Look what, you see what you watched when you watched TV in 1939? You didn't watch TV. You watched a mirror that reflected the image. It's kind of like almost watching a projection of TV. And this one we have in the Smithsonian, we have that original record when Woody Guthrie sat down in the studio of Mo Ash here in New York City and started a song, This Land is Your Land. Do you want to sing? <laughs> this Land is Your Land. That, uh, you know, it's almost like another, uh, he wrote it in New York City, recorded in New York City, uh, and uh, is really a treasure of the Smithsonian. And then you have small items that tell big stories. Again, I think it's hard to read this from the, um, from where you're sitting, most of you sitting anyway. This is a postal stamp in our postal museum. David, can you read the date on that? December 6th, 1941. Yeah, December 6th. So this was on the USS Oklahoma. The guys that would have changed that date to December 7th did not get a chance to do it that morning. So a small item that tells a huge story about Pearl Harbor. Who's that? Wrong, wrong, wrong. She apocryphally, she later became Rosie the River. At the beginning, this poster that's now become so famous, you know, was really shown in Pittsburgh and a few places in Ohio for about uh, six weeks. And she wasn't Rosie. She uh, later became called Rosie uh, after uh, Norman Rockwell did a cover on the uh, uh, Saturday Evening Post and named it Rosie the Riveter. And then it was really in the women's movement in the 70s that she then gets used and becomes an icon and starts being called Rosie the River. Before that, she was not. I just saw this plane uh, I, uh, the other day. It was over at our Udvar Hazi Center. This is the Enola game. This is where the atomic age began, dropped the bomb that ended World War II, and ushered in the atomic age. And then something that came out of, uh, also has roots in New York, Jonas Salk went to school here, uh, was um, med school and so on, the polio vaccine. And for, for, you, you know, for younger people, you don't realize, but I think the older people in the audience remember, in the 1950s, we feared polio as much as the Russians. There were quarantines, there was uh, tremendously fearful. And when the Salk vaccine came in, people just rejoiced around the country. This is the vaccine. There were three strains of the vaccine that Salk tested. This is the syringe. This is what he used on himself and his lab assistants and his, families to his family to test the vaccine. And then you have items like Warhol. Warhol ran out of stuff to do here in New York, so he did a Marilyn Monroe, and Milton Glaser did the Bob Dylan thing, and these, these things have been so popular and real treasures of the Smithsonian. And then items like this, the Greensboro lunch counter, we have a section of it carved out of the Woolworths. This is where four African-American men on February 1st, 1960, went into a Woolworths and asked to be served, sat down. They sat down to stand up for their rights, and it became 
a rallying cry for the civil rights movement. And then we have Julia Child's Kitchen, which people love. And Julia Child loved the Smithsonian. Uh, if you remember Julia, and you know, Julia was in the OSS, the predecessor to the CIA. And she served with a former head of the Smithsonian, Dylan Ripley. They were buddies together in India and uh, uh, Ceylon, Sri Lanka. And when uh, Julia, Julia had done programs for the Smithsonian, but when she was going to go back to Santa Barbara, she was living up in Cambridge in Massachusetts. She was going back. She got in touch with us. And we said, we'd really like some things from your kitchen, Julia. And she said, OK, come on up. And, um, and uh, Raina Green and Nancy Davis and Paula Johnson went up to Julia Child's kitchen. And they thought, oh, we'll take a spatula. Uh, we'll take a garland stove, we'll take a pan. And what they found was Julia Child was this incredibly organized curator of her own kitchen. And so the curators kind of scratched their head. They came up with three things. They ended up taking the whole kitchen, including the kitchen sink. <laughs> and that's at the Smithsonian and recreated there. Neil Armstrong spacesuit, how many of us remember watching and going to the moon? I mean, how can, you know, it's one of those one of those times where Americans really uh, enjoyed a, uh, a, a really um, a joint uh, national experience. Now, I like this. I like this spacesuit for several reasons. First, it represents the height at that time of science and technology and engineering. I mean, who would have thought a generation before this, any time in the human history, to go to the moon? Just fantasy. It was American science and engineering in the face of Sputnik, challenge with the Cold War, catch up to the Russians, stress st what are now we call STEM disciplines, get to the moon, enable a, a human being to survive. So I love it for that. Um, I love it because it was a symbol of the American imagination. Remember Kennedy's challenge. We're going to send a man to the moon before the end of the decade. Man, bring him back before the end of the decade. So it was more than science and engineering. It was an act of national will and imagination. I like it for a third reason, and the third reason is, pe is one that people really don't know about and should. So um, uh, when I was a kid here in, uh, in uh, growing up in, uh, in New York and Queens, and we we go out to a pond, go ice skating in the summer, and my um, uh, mom would dress dress me up, you know, to go ice skating, right? You know, layers and layers, and you, you kind of couldn't move. Well, that's kind of how they designed the spacesuit at first. When NASA did the first competition to say, okay, we're going to design a spacesuit that's going to allow astronauts to be on the moon, to bend down, to jump around, to move around, to do things, you got to design a spacesuit. So it was all guys who designed the spacesuit. And they designed it with aluminum and plastic and all, all sorts of metallic stuff. And the astronauts, the spacesuits came back, you know, that were going to be used for the Apollo mission, and they were like my mom dressed me for ice skating. You could not move. NASA said, this is not going to do. These guys got to work on the moon. They got to bend down. So, so NASA holds a competition. They all open competition to design the spacesuit that will take us to the moon. Who wins the competition? A company called International Latex Corporation, better known as Playtex. 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 Why do they win the competition? Because Playtex knows about layering. They know about flexibility. They know about movement. Why do they know that? Because they design ladies' girdles, bras, and stuff. So Playtex wins the competition. And when you look at NASA and the design of the spacesuits, you literally see women sitting by sewing machines making these to fit the particular astronauts and just like they would make girdles and bras. And so when you hear that statement about Neil Armstrong, what do you say, a, a small step for a man, a giant step for mankind, you can add, and a bigger step for ladies' underwear. <laughs> But that's how we got to the moon. That's how we got to the moon. So the whole idea that creativity and innovation comes from all sorts of quarters, even surprising ones. That's why I love that space. We have at the Smithsonian Kermit the Frog, even before he was Kermit, made out of the felt coat of his mother and with little ping pong ball eyes and R2-D2 and C-3PO and the first big electronic computer, the ENIAC and Steve Jobs' uh, first Mac and uh, artwork like Nam June Pike's Electronic Superhighway that he did here, his studio was here in New York and even totem poles still being carved today in Alaska, David Boxley's totem pole. 
And then we have items that tell intriguing and tough story, fragments of the Berlin Wall, another one of those moments uh, of freedom's triumph. We collected, and the Smithsonian was uh, assigned by Congress to collect the artifacts of 9-11. Uh, and for our curators, when you hear those accounts, they're the toughest curatorial job anybody's ever had to go into those uh, containers in Shanksville, to work in, uh, kill in, in out, out here in Staten Island and uh, down at World Trade Center site, to work at the Pentagon. Uh, but, uh, and, and much of the Smithsonian's collection is now here in the city at the 9-11 Memorial Museum. So, uh, but, but amazing. And, you know, we did an exhibit at the Smithsonian. It's kind of like, it, it is at, at the museum. You know, I, I remember being in line. We all remember this audience, although some of the young people were very young then. You know, I remember standing in line, we did an exhibit. We just had black uh, tablecloths on tables, and we had these artifacts from 9-11. And it was 10 years after. And I was standing behind a, a, I was a young teenager, maybe he was four years old or three years old. He kind of vaguely remembered, you know, that this has happened. And just seeing those artifacts, you come into proximity. You, you see a crumpled up tray from Flight 93, and you, you know, it just does something to you. You see a squeegee that a guy in the World Trade Center used to open up an elevator, open up a window to get out. Just, it, it gives you that visceral connection, and it reminds us why, why we have places like this, why we have museums, so we could touch and feel and have that visceral experience of the things that made history, that connect us to history.